Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number CV 220533, Hamra. The Embry. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded, so we ask counsel to please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's clock, appellant's counsel rather, is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if desired. Also, we have read the briefs and we have discussed this case in conference. So with that, counsel, you may now proceed. Good morning. May it please the court, Robert Henry of Snell and Wilmer on behalf of uh, appellant uh, Embry Partners, LLC. This court should reverse and remand this action to the trial court for dismissal because the trial court should have never entertained this case in the first instance. Appley Hamra did not and does not have standing to bring this claim against Embry and this case simply was not and is not justiciable under numerous justiciability. Aren't those separate um, concepts that we need to address independently? Is standing in judici justiciability, are they unique, distinct, or are they tied together here in this case? That, that is a fantastic question. Uh, my best reading of all of the justiciability case law that I have been combing through is that they are conceptually distinct, but the analysis sometimes blends over to one another. But I do treat them, and I do intend to treat them during the argument, as if you first have to establish justiciability, I mean, uh, standing. The plaintiff has to have standing to bring the claim. And then there's the assessment as to whether the case is justiciable under the various doctrines, be it ripeness, advisory opinion, etc. Uh, this court should also reverse and remand because affirming the trial court, effectively holding that it can be proper for a trial court to issue advisory opinions under a fact pattern like this would open up, respectfully, a Pandora's box of problems. The list of hypothetical cases that could come before Arizona courts is endless if cases like this are entertained and adjudicated before they are in fact justiciable. But that's the reason for the well-established justiciability doctrine that prohibits courts from issuing advisory opinions. Yet that, with all due respect, is what the trial court did here. It issued an impermissible and incorrect advisory opinion. The trial court should be reversed. It is appropriate and prudent. Let me let me interrupt you again, because yes, you've suggested reversing and remanding, and and maybe this is too technical an issue to get hung up on. But why wouldn't the correct response be to vacate the ruling before reverse indicates that we think you should have come out the other way. Vacate means we think that the order should just be erased. In effect, I I would submit that that would be the same, um, and thus our request would be then to either dismiss or vacate. It is appropriate and prudent to focus first with where the trial court should have begun and, and ended its analysis, that is on the issue of standing. Did Appley Hamra have standing to bring this action in the first place? The answer is it did not. As the Arizona Supreme Court has observed, it is a quote requirement that, a, that as a matter of sound jurisprudence, a litigant must first establish standing. Counsel, um, because we have limited time, can we, can we address the, is, the issue of justiciability? Let's assume for a moment that there is standing. Can we get right to the issue of justiciability? Absolutely, Your Honor.
even if the court were to overlook the standing problem, this court should reverse and remand or vacate this case for numerous other justiciability reasons. The Arizona Supreme Court has also reminded Arizona courts to exercise restraint to ensure they refrain from issuing advisory opinions, that cases be ripe for decision and not moot, and that issues be fully developed between true adversaries. That is, that a case be justiciable. But this matter was not justiciable and still isn't. We can start with the doctrine of ripeness and the well-established requirement that a dispute should not be adjudicated until, quote, rights have become fixed under an existing set of facts. We cite numerous authorities to that effect in our briefs and in the motion to dismiss briefing below at page 11. Here, this case was never ripe for a judicial decision and still isn't because none of the numerous conditions or events necessary to make this dispute ripe for adjudication have happened and may not ever happen. Embry has not yet acquired property that it is under contract to possibly acquire. It hasn't even finished its due diligence and feasibility studies on this property. Embry is thus not an owner of any of the property at issue in this litigation. Aren't those things that are basically within Embry's control, though? In looking at the cases that you cited in your briefs, it seems like there's a distinction made between things that are within Embry's or within the litigant's control and those that are outside of its control. Do you disagree with that? Well, I do think the cases obviously entertain future events and conditions, some of which are within a party's control, perhaps, and others of which, of course, are not. But I think the concept still applies. And the reason it matters, or I think it matters, and I don't speak for the panel, of course, but the issues that if Embry has clearly and unequivocally stated and at least initially contracted to oblige itself to do certain things and said, this is our plan and we're going forward, that seems like a pretty clear course of action and not a lot of contingencies subject to that. So my hesitation on the justiciability is more tied to things outside of Embry's control. So what are some of those things that Embry doesn't have final say on that might prevent this thing from happening? Well, I submit that everything else that we set forth in our briefs, and I will summarize here, the conditions and events that need to occur to make this case ripe are outside Embry's control. First and foremost, if it were to proceed and close on this transaction and it did formulate its final plans, it would then have to submit those plans to the Kierlin Design Review Committee for that committee, which is an arm of the Master Association for Kierlin out there, for that committee to review and approve and comment on, and I suppose as most processes like this, perhaps ask for conditions on similar to any adjudicated process like this at the administrative level. And would Embry have the opportunity to weigh in and oppose? How does the review commission work? Is it just a unilateral type process between the buyer, between your client and the KRDC, or is it more of a litigative approach that parties can weigh in and say, we don't think you should approve this design? Do they have standing there to assert objections? First, I have to preface my answer by saying that the answer to your question is not in the record. Okay. And I am speculating to some degree, just from familiarity with these processes and other developments. But I would submit that any person who has some vested interest out there at Kierlin, such as HAMRA, for example, if it were, in fact, the owner at the time, any person with an interest could be heard. I mean, I know of no reason why someone couldn't submit something to the Kierlin Design Review Committee in saying, I have these concerns. But that's not spelled out in the declaration. I don't believe it's spelled out in the declaration, in the 66-page declaration, but it does give the Kierlin Design Review Committee pretty clear authority to oversee the whole process. But how that process would work, I can't fathom how you would. Well, first, the questions here are begging the issue, which is we don't know what the Kierlin Design Review Committee would do when these were submitted. If there were a set of facts upon which somebody did have a legitimate grievance and wasn't effectively heard, I submit that's a different case. That's not the case before us. 
And that's essentially the argument we're making. To what degree do we weigh the fact that Embry made statements uh, that it would build a certain uh, type of structure and the fact that there were uh, site plans prepared? How much weight do we give that? To the, to the justiciability yes. analysis, I, I submit very little. It's the case law submits that the intention is not sufficient. Um, you need to have some overt act, something moving forward with the project. There are a whole slew of things that could happen. Uh, Embry, as the record do, does reflect, hasn't even con finished, and I know, I know it goes to your point about it's under its control, but it hasn't con finished its feasibility study. These plans may be altered. The plans that are ultimately considered, whether it be by the Kirlin Design Review Committee, or to go back to your question, another step in the process, ultimately zoning authorities and regulatory authorities would need to be heard on this. And what, what, what does the record show about the current zoning of, the, of this p parcel? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't hear your question. <clears throat> what does the record show about the current zoning of this parcel? There's a reference in the briefing that they'll need a zoning change. What does the record show about uh, on that issue? Other than statements in a brief, what does the record show about that? I don't believe the parties were able to develop the record on that issue in the one-day hearing that was made available. It was That's part of the procedural concerns that Embry has with how this all came out. Uh, there was very limited briefing on the issues. Uh, there was a one-day evidentiary trial uh, with limited witnesses. But to answer your question, we don't know. But again, that goes back to my point. We, this is, we're trying to debate. We are, in fact, right now debating a set of facts that we don't know. And that's the underlying issue with justiciability and whether a case is right or whether ruling on a set of assumed facts, a discussion, is proper for a trial court or a court. It's issuing an advisory opinion. If so there's nothing in the record that shows whether this parcel is zoned for a multifamily use? I don't believe it's in the record. I will okay. check in my, my time before rebuttal, but I don't believe it is. But I, I'm aware that it, there was no contrary evidence that there would need to be a zoning approval, ultimately, to build an apartment complex at some point at some point, there are other steps that will need to be taken, and no one has submitted evidence to the contrary on that. And ultimately, um, we don't know what this project will look like after it goes through this process, however this process plays out. But again, I'm going to keep hammering this point. That's the record we need to have before the trial court and ultimately an appellate court, such as you, to assess the respective rights and interests of the parties here. It's not just the ripeness, though, although I do think that all of these concepts to varying degrees do overlap. I do think what we ultimately have here is on its face an advisory opinion. The complaint is a slew of ifs. If we acquire, and it's not in the record, but we noted in our brief that it's our understanding that Hamrod has now acquired their property. But if Embry acquires its property, and if it submits the plans that it was contemplating at the time of the trial court, and if the Kierlin Design Review Committee approves those plans and doesn't make any changes, and if the zoning authorities don't change them or require other modifications, or if Embry, for whatever reason, the economy, who knows what, decides not to proceed with this. That is the danger of an advisory opinion, because ultimately what we have here now is a declaratory, essentially a declaratory judgment on the rights of parcel owners at parcel 4B at Kierland. Meanwhile, on another justiciability doctrine, again, this, there needs to be a fight between true adversaries. We submit that the true adversaries were not all before trial court. Most notably, the Kierland Design Review Committee probably would like to be heard that they're no longer, at least over here on parcel 4B, they don't have any authority to uh, approve any plans that allegedly encroach into a building area. For Did you assert that below that there were necessary parties that weren't made subject to the litigation? I, I think it was inherent in the arguments, but I don't know. There was no real party and interest type argument. We did make, we, we, we made the argument certainly that the parties with interests at stake haven't been heard. It goes more into the argument as to why this is a hypothetical set of facts. But there was no motion to join an indispensable party, anything like that? No, there is not, Your Honor. Nor did plaintiffs join the other parties. 
nor did the two parcel owners at the time of the filing complaint of the two parts the two sub parcels at issue they were not parties to this case nor were the other affected parcel owners at 4B heard from in this case regardless of the reasons the record before the court was incomplete it wasn't between all of the true adversaries it was based upon a hypothetical after hypothetical and ultimately it was an issuance of an advisory opinion that we submit was incorrect we don't think the court should have even gotten to the merits and we've made our arguments in our briefing as to why the ultimate ruling on the merits was also incorrect which will largely stand on for purposes of time today but we don't think the court any court should have gotten to this issue now it's a dangerous precedent if we start allowing litigants to come in I view it in my world in the real estate litigation world if net if it's now okay for a party under a purchase contract to acquire a property that has concerns about something call it a neighboring property owners use or potential or threatened use of property nearby that could be a nuisance or that they're uncertain whether they're gonna get zoning they're gonna leapfrog the ordinary course come in and try to get an advisory opinion if this happens what now as a litigant representing these parties I would welcome that but that's not the what the law allows as a litigant that's different of course parties want to come in I understand entirely why Hamra wanted this relief I submit though that it wasn't entitled to this relief this forum for this relief to be adjudicated certainly not at the time and on the record that it had going into this matter so I bounced around a fair bit and thank you and I will reserve what limited time I have for rebuttal thank you for your questions thank you morning your honors may it please the court as well does the court have any questions first of me actually I do would you like to announce first for the record would you like to announce for the record I'm sorry I apologize Dennis will and check for the happily sorry thank you I do have a question I want to ask you about your brief about a statement that begins on page 32 of your brief it says the elephant in the room is that and that Embry is desperately trying to ignore is that Embry could absolutely construct its apartment building in such a way that easement rights are preserved it could build in a different configuration to preserve the same density it goes on to quote from the hearing and then it says there's no evidence that Embry could not build with the same density desired with a different plan so why not make that argument to the Kuhlman Design Review Committee why go to court why not wait to see what if the Kuhlman Design Review Committee agrees with you because that wasn't the issue in the case and with all the respect to counsel let me clarify that there's some of the broad sweeping statements I just heard here's where the case started from okay the case started from a meeting as the record will reflect between mr. Lazarus and mr. Wood from Snell and Wilmer in which mr. Lazarus was advised that both parties were going to close on their respective properties we had $150,000 earnest money at stake and Lazarus was advised by mr. Wood that the position of Embry was very simply that paragraph 1.2 allowed them to encroach into the easement okay that's where this started from mr. Lazarus looked at paragraph 1.2 and concluded that it says just the opposite in the first sentence it makes it clear that that can't be the case or eviscerate the entire point of the easement established by the master developer who also created the master CC&Rs and the Design Review Committee so that's where this case started from okay and that was the issue that was presented which was of paramount importance to both parties because they had a fundamental disagreement on the application of 1.2 it wasn't this broad sweeping advisory opinion on everything in the world now to get to your question your honor what happened then at the hearing was that opposing counsel who was not it was mr. the other counsel here brought up this issue for the first time about the Design Review Committee in paragraph 16 okay so that came up at basically at the hearing wasn't even the really in the pretrial preserved 
court listened to it anyway, allowed them to put on whatever evidence they wanted on it. There is nothing that was presented by them, and they had every opportunity, and I take umbrage really to the remarks, that somehow they were prevented somehow, as I heard it, from presenting evidence of some kind. They weren't prevented from doing anything. They could have called any witnesses they wanted, including anyone from the Design Review Committee, from the Board of the Master Association, to an expert, to anybody on that issue, and they didn't. Mr. Wilenchek, do you dispute that there's still the need for approvals from the Design Review Committee and zoning approvals necessary before the project as they've proposed it could be completed? That was not part of the record with respect to zoning. I didn't ask that. Do you dispute that there's still those two requirements seem to be met before the project can be finalized? Well, there's a lot of, I'm trying to answer you honestly, there's a lot of requirements, I'll answer it this way, there are a lot of requirements I'm sure that have to be met. I'm sure they didn't finalize their plan as was testified at the hearing, as the question was asked of me. I'm sure they do have to go in front of a Design Review Committee as to their actual construction of the design that they're intending to put, but there is nothing that they presented in the Master, CC&Rs, or anywhere else that they presented in this case that indicates that there's anything left to be done that's important that needed to be presented at that hearing for the court to make its decision on the interpretation of paragraph 1.2 and paragraph 16. How do you know the Design Review Committee wouldn't agree with what you said in your brief about the elephant in the room? How do you know they wouldn't agree with you? I don't know. Of course they could agree with us. I'm sure they would agree with us. In which case this whole lawsuit was for nothing because the Design Review Committee would make him and me change its plans. No, because the point that we're making here has nothing to do, Your Honor, with the factual issue of whether or not the Design Review Committee has to look, of course, at plans to approve of a design. That has nothing to do with the issue here of the encroachment into the easement. That was the issue that needed to get resolved. Could they destroy the easement in terms of what they were doing? That has nothing to do with the Design Review Committee. It has nothing to do with zoning. It has to do with an interpretation of the easement and the master CC&Rs. But it doesn't really matter how Embry interprets the master documents, the declaration and other documents. What matters is how does Kierland interpret it? Will Kierland let Embry do what it wants to do? No, it has nothing to do with Kierland allowing it anything to do. And that was not part of the record. It has to do with them saying that once we build, we decide to build into the easement, you have no easement and it's destroyed, which would destroy our whole point in wanting to be at the property in the first place. Exactly. What if the Design Review Committee says, no, you can't build that? You may want to, but you can't. With all due respect, there's lots of speculation I can give you about lots of things that may happen. Tomorrow we may not be able to wake up. Lots of things could happen. But there was no evidence that the Design Review Committee has any authority over this issue whatsoever of the encroachment. In fact, it doesn't if you look at the master CC&Rs. All right. Well, what about Phoenix zoning? Don't they have to approve a zoning change? I assume in all honesty that, of course, they probably do have to approve the zoning if it's not properly zoned. But whether that occurs or not was not an issue in the case. It didn't come up. And just as the Design Review Committee may have to approve the actual plan, zoning may actually have to approve that plan as well. But that has nothing to do with the interpretation of the easement, which is the whole issue that Embry had brought to the table. Embry was saying, we are going to eventually litigate this issue. We are going to take the position that we have the right to encroach into that area. And the issue was, does the easement, and vis-a-vis the master CC&Rs and what they say about easements, does that or anything in the Design Review Committee guidelines that they raised prevent that from happening or not? And they presented no evidence but pure speculation on that issue. And speculation has nothing to do with the interpretation of whether that easement says what it says on paragraph 1.2 and 16. Is it true that Embry could not construct its proposed structure without getting a zoning change, getting building permits from the city, and getting approval of the Design Review Committee? Is that a true statement? Again, it may be a true statement. It may be a true statement. I could not stand here and argue with the court on that. Again, there are lots of other things that may have to happen too. But whether or not that affects the interpretation of the actual document the court was asked to interpret under 12.18.31 at SEC and 12.18.42, which construes that statute liberally, was the issue. That was what she was asked for, not an advisory opinion in general about life to come. 
It was specifically, what is the interpretation? Is Embry's interpretation something that they can raise? It has nothing to do with zoning. It has nothing to do with design review committees and the building that they build. It has to do with the encroachment into the easement and whether there's any documentation anywhere that they presented that allowed to support their position that once they build or encroach into it by their choice, that they then destroy the easement. That was the original issue. If they do so. I'm sorry? If they choose to do so. Well, they said they were going to do so. Otherwise, we would have wasted our time to be there. That's what they said, and they affirmed that at the trial. And I disagree with counsel. That was specifically stated at the trial by their own client representative. They are going to close. They are going to build. They are going to encroach into that easement. And my client was at risk on that and needed a resolution of that. And that's absolutely in the record. I certainly understand why your client I understand why your client would want to have this resolved prior to them closing on the deal. That makes a lot of sense. But it seems that there's at least two opportunities for them to engage before getting the courts involved. And that would be in the Design Review Commission and in any zoning hearing and permit application process. Why are the courts the first option that we should allow kind of us to jump the gun before we know what is going to happen down the road? Well, with all due respect, Your Honor, I'm not going to debate the court's power to do anything. But the court exercises discretion under 121831. And under the language which says that any person interested in a contract or whose rights are affected by a contract has the right to bring such an action. And 12, I think it's 1842, which construes that liberally. But our Supreme Court has also said in connection with declaratory judgment actions that they should not, we don't have the authority to weigh in where the allegations merely show an intent to do certain things in the future, all of which are dependent upon future events and contingencies. And that's Morvey Boland from 1950. And then in 2007, this court said future rights cannot be determined in a declaratory relief action, quote, in anticipation of an event that may never happen. And it certainly, I can't look at this record and say that there isn't at least a possibility, and it may be small, that this won't happen. That's not in the record, Your Honor, with all due respect to you. You're telling me there's nothing in the record to suggest that there's future contingencies that have to happen? No, that's not what I said. The deals have to close? Is that a future contingency? That's not what I said. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. What I said was. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. What I said was. You said there's nothing in the record that would show that. Yeah, the latter part of what you said, which is with respect to what Embry's intention was. I didn't say intention. I said future contingencies, and you said there's nothing in the record to show that. Oh, future contingencies. Yeah. Of course, I just said, of course there are future contingencies that can occur in any deal. I agree with that. Okay, so don't we have to wait until those contingencies are resolved before we weigh in? I don't think so, because I think, as the court said, to go to your point, the Supreme Court said in the city surprise case, which we cited, the Arizona versus Arizona Corporation Commission, that in that case, it dealt with standing, not necessarily justiciability issue, but it said. I agree with you on standing, by the way. I think your client has standing, and although this would just be an advisory opinion, I think you probably have the better of the substantive argument as well. But we have to figure out whether this is a ripe issue, whether this is justiciable now. Well, what was justiciable, sorry, justiciable, is the fact that it was ripe because, and that's what I was going to, they specifically told us both before and during the hearing itself, they did intend to close. They did intend to do this. So it wasn't a question that they might. That's what I was addressing. Okay. And, of course, we absolutely were going to close, okay, and that was the whole point of it. So everything was ripe to determine whether or not they had the right to even attempt to encroach into that. That is not something before the Design Review Committee. It is not a board, a legal board, a court. It has no rights that were ever shown in this record to determine that issue at all. It has rights as our witnesses testify to design and things of that nature. There's nothing in the record, Your Honor, and I would suggest there's things in the record, and I may have misstated this in the brief, and I apologize for this, by the way. I wanted to point this out. The master CC&Rs actually do discuss easement, but they don't discuss destruction of the easement, okay? In fact, they discuss, if anything, the establishment and right to an easement 
And there's nothing in there to suggest anything other than that, and there's nothing to suggest that the Design Review Committee has the authority, if you will, to determine the issues that this court determined. And that's what I was trying to address. I didn't mean to quibble with you. I just... No, and, and it makes all the sense in the world to me that the parties both would like to understand what their rights and obligations right. are. But until, at least as I read the case law, until that's fixed, that this easement is going to be violated, we don't get to weigh in in advance. Well, just like I wouldn't be able to, uh, in, in anticipation of buying a Ford car, ask for declaratory judgment that the, the warranty should last 100 years. You know, but I have to buy the car and then I can sue under the warranty. But then the law that says that the declaratory relief statute may be invoked either before or after a breach would not be there. You can invoke the declaratory relief right. statute. Right, you don't, you don't have to wait until they actually infringe the right. easement, but until all the contingencies are settled and now the easement's going to be infringed, then you can sue. Well, when you say, with, with all due respect, when you say all the contingencies have to be settled, I don't know what that means in fairness, because they can come up and will come up with all kinds of other contingencies. Anyone could in any declaratory relief action, I suspect. The issue is, is it right for determination of the specific interpretation of the document of what was the contract, the REA? That's the issue. The interpretation of that is not for the Design Review Committee, with all due respect. It is not for the Master Board, and there's nothing in those documents that provides that. It is for a court to determine what the interpretation of that contract is. And that has nothing to do with, with, with anything other than that interpretation. Right, but once the Design Review Committee says, we approve of your plan, and the zoning has been granted, and the building permits have been granted, and then we're, we know now they're going to infringe upon this easement, then that's when you get to sue under declaratory well, relief. Their, their witness stated that, I don't know if this is directly relevant to answer you, so, but their witness stated that there was a course of conduct and other parcels, et cetera. The court said, no, in this parcel, we're talking about this parcel. And, you know, you are going to go, apparently, to the Design Review Committee after this is resolved, is what he said. Most of these happen after the issues are resolved. Well, that's what we're asking the court to do, is to resolve it, to take his words and his testimony. He said it goes to the Design Review Committee. In my experience, he said, I can only tell you what he said, after these issues are all resolved. So, contrary to what you're suggesting, their own witness was saying, no, that's not the way it works. We want it resolved or it gets resolved before we go to the Design Review Committee because they don't have power over that issue. So we need to know, I think both parties frankly needed to know the answer before you ever get to the Design Review Committee and waste your time and money to do so. Can you encroach or not? Otherwise, why would you prepare all these expensive plans and all the rest of it and go to the zoning and everything else if later on it turns out the court finds you couldn't do it? It's a waste of money. And that's exactly what I think the declaratory relief statute honestly is designed to prevent that kind of waste on their side and our side and waste of money because the same dispute will come back again, right? So why not resolve it now before everybody gets to that point and knows because their witness also but said- we, we don't know that the same dispute will come back. Maybe the design review committee will say, no, we don't want a, a multifamily unit here. The design review committee it. doesn't have the power to deal with that. That's my whole point. And there's nothing in this record to suggest otherwise. And that's the whole point. There's nothing in the uh, master CCNRs. There was no witness from the Design Review Committee. There was no expert, anyone, to testify to what I'm hearing. The Design Review Committee doesn't have power. That, and they didn't call anyone from the Design Review Committee to say that because they could have, and they didn't. The Design Review Committee's role is limited according to our witnesses, and that was the only testimony. Both of our witnesses, Mr. Irish and Mr. Lazarus, both testified that based on their review, the Design Review Committee has no jurisdiction over those kinds of issues. Doesn't the declaration say that no structure shall be erected, constructed, placed, altered, modified, remodeled, or permitted to remain unless uh, uh, plan specifications are approved by the Design Review Committee? Yes, of course. And what I'm talking about, what it's talking about there is, as our witnesses testify, is the actual design of the building itself, not whether it uh, unlawfully violates the easement, which is a legal issue that we ask the court to determine before it ever wastes time to get to a design review committee to approve the actual plan. The zoning, the plan, the design review committee has nothing to do with the determination of that issue. They, the, there's the, nothing design to review committee, the design review committee has authority in the declaration to make subjective d d judgments uh, about, um, in such manner as it may deem appropriate, 
about what, what can be built here. Sure, it can do anything it wants. But the point is whether or not it gets the legal right to determine that. And they don't. There's nothing saying they do. The declaration says they do. It says nothing about easements or, or, or determining rights to easements or destruction of easements whatsoever. No, but it says they get to decide whether something can be built. Oh, yes, and, in and the they... context, as our witnesses testified, in the context of the actual design of the building itself, which their witness said could be reconfigured if the design review committee has a problem with the design. And we can say all day long, this is what we're going to build. But they can't build it unless the design review committee signs off on it. And we don't yes, know that they will. That. But, but the, I don't know why I can't get this across. I apologize. But the design review committee is not there to be a legal body to uh, adjudicate whether or not under any of these documents they have the right to encroach into an easement. That's the sole issue. Well, maybe they'll, the design review committee would reject the proposal for other reasons. Well, there's lots of things that could happen. I agree with you. Lots of things could happen. But it has values with the issue we went to court on. That's the issue, and that issue is not for a design review committee with all due respect. It's an issue for a court to decide the interpretation. But isn't that a, until the- Frankly, if we went to the design review committee, we'd be in court anyway, right? Well, we don't know that because we don't know what they would do. Well, it, one party would, certainly, because they could either rule it for or against that party, so the other party would appeal that. So the court stepped in, knowing all of that, to say, this is my interpretation and I think her interpretation is absolutely correct based on, on the reading that they've ignored the first sentences in both of those provisions. And, and I think her reasoning was sound. That's for a court to determine the interpretation of, not a design review committee. And that's what our witnesses testify to. They had no witnesses that testified otherwise. This is all speculative stuff that they're asking you to speculate on. But there's no evidence in the record. The court, as a trier of fact, should be upheld on what she found based on the evidence that was before her. And that was part of the evidence, Your Honor. And I believe it must be upheld, unless it was an abuse of discretion or there's no evidence to support it. But there was. And they presented nothing in response. So that's my best answer for that in the few seconds I have left. But be glad to answer anything else. All right. Thank you, Counselor. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, first, to turn back to a question about whether the zoning and KDRC issues were in the record and the future contingencies, et cetera, uh, it, it's in the Shu Pei Chow testimony, which is in the record. Um, for example, um, at um, 228, there's the testimony of uh, Mr. Chow as to how you have, um, uh, as to, um, how you have to get the KDRC approval and the zoning approval, et cetera. Those are in the record. But your, your opponent's point is that the, as I understand them, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, that because zoning or because the easement is beyond the scope of whatever they approve, there's, it makes no sense to wait for them to weigh in before, um, because the easement issue won't be resolved by whatever they decide. So, can you respond to that? Well, one, we don't know what they're going to decide. That's the first fatal, I submit, problem with, with, with doing the analysis. Second, there's this continued argument that there's some type of evisceration of an easement right. There is no evisceration of an easement right here. There is a change in certain contours out there that the KDRC, under Section 7.3 of the Master Declaration, which is in the record, gives the... I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to waste time on whether this would or would not violate the easement. It's just since the, the, my question is, since the KDRC has no easement enforcement authority, why should we wait for them to decide this issue? Well, well, going back to the litany of things, first, you'd have to have the true adversaries advocating as to what are the easement rights out there. We don't have all the parties and stakeholders there, including the KDRC and the other parcel owners at 4B, for, among others. Um, Second, I don't think that this is an adjudication of an easement right, necessarily. The easement, we've never argued that Hammer's, Hammer's easement rights uh, will be uh, taken away or they will not have the same easement rights before or after any potential construction. It's just where they will be 
Okay. And, and turning to the REA in that regard, I think it is significant that if this, if this was a set in stone easement right, like at most easements, there'd be a, a legal description as to where the part, where the easement was. There isn't, nor should there be in the, in the way these interrelated agreements operate. Because as I, as I believe Judge Kiley was getting at, the KDRC ultimately decides where all the improvements out there at Kierlin generally, not just 4B, are located and how they should be designed and what issues should be addressed in the construction and placement of those improvements. That's ultimately the KDRC's determination. But again, it keeps going back to the problem we have with the arguments today and at the trial court and at any time prior to all these future contingencies happening. We don't know what this is going to look like after the process is played through. Um, second, to touch on a, a point that uh, Mr. Wilenshack kept making, that there's no, nothing in the record about how the KDRC will operate. Well, the only witness who had personal knowledge about KDRC issues was Mr. Shu Pei Chow. And he testified about all the processes and issues and how the KDRC and the Master Association had handled other, other projects, how these issues had been had evolved in other scenarios, how the parties at issue, the course of conduct out there, which we submit the course of conduct, which the court gave no weight to, but there was no competing testimony as to what the course of conduct was. The only person who testified, unrebutted, testified that this is how it works. So I, I, I do take issue with counsel's suggestion that there was nothing in the record or no testimony about all, how the process works and how this would have to go forward by Embry if it were to proceed with this project after all is said and done, if it closed, if it went to the zoning uh, boards and got the necessary approvals. And it would, the record shows that they at least understood that they would need to get zoning approval and that the record shows that they knew that they would have to get KDRC approval. When those two things, at least those two things happen, we'll know what this project would look like if it were to be constructed. But again, Arizona case law requires more than intent. This is our goal. This is our objective. There's no dispute about that. But we all have great intentions. Things happen. Sometimes people tell us no or say you can't do it that way, but you can do it this way. There's a give and take. All right, counsel, you're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate counsel's arguments and briefing. This matter is now taken under advisement and we will issue a written ruling in due time. We're at recess.